Only a fool learns from his own mistakes. The wise man, however, learns from the mistakes of others. This is a very strong and brilliant quote by the Otto van Bismarck. It evokes so much about human experience and our fascination with internal and external evolutions. But what if we applied this idea of learning from others' past mistakes, even our own ancestry, to ourselves? Now, I know what you're thinking, and no, I'm not about to turn this into some politically charged, biased, agenda-driven speech. I aim to strike far deeper with this idea, as I have given it quite some thought over the years. Now, whether you're talking about your specific cone of individual lineage or a much broader scope of societal history, let's just say post-enlightenment for the sake of specificity, any time political realms of our society are allowed to play out this drama between science and religion and pitted against each other, society that we're speaking about here most often develops volatile, gross symptoms even. And you might ask, what symptoms, right? You're probably thinking, I thought this was a philosophical analysis of societal unrest today, not a doctor's visit, right? Well, today I'm going to address the major symptoms, sites, and experienced in human society's past, and along the way, hopefully I can paint a fuller picture as to what these illnesses that congest us all and our societies look like, so that we can identify the problem and from there live more fulfilled lives and fulfill those around us. So, for the sake of the argument, we start here post-enlightenment to assess the absolute power of Roman Catholicism as a state specifically in its governing of most of Europe until roughly 1905 with the final separation of church and state, though church and state were married for at least two, arguably three centuries that predate this. So you see the issue here is not necessarily Christian theology, but rather the immovable political force it formed in the early 1700s that would reign as an absolute monarchy and model for monarchies for centuries to come. This monarchy would present countless issues and societal growth stunts for the blossoming of the Enlightenment across Europe, what is often seen in all of recorded history, human history, as the most pivotal, significant, important explosion of innovation and in human thought to ever be. I mean, I think of this point in history honestly like a dam bursting. The dam is the marriage of political realms of monarchies and the rigid ideology of Roman Catholicism. Together, the brilliant ideas of one such Galileo were rejected for almost a century because of this ignorance. When Galileo first proposed that the sun was at the center of our solar system and not the earth, not us, he was prosecuted and stripped of his ability to teach not only these ideas, but from ever teaching again. And some 20 years later, he was placed under house arrest until the death so that his ideas could never see the light of day. You see, the idea that our planet is not at the center of our known universe contradicted not only the creation story of Christianity at the time, but it also undermined the very theology that places humans at the right hand of God. Instead of being created in the image of God to benefit from all that he created for us humans under the increasing scrutinizing unbiased lens of scientific methods and hypothesis through the Enlightenment, we seem less and less special in the increasing discoverable vast ocean of the cosmos. Right, so in the last two symptoms seem to be more of specifically isolated incident in our beautifully flawed history. So this time I'd, I'd have to chalk the fault up to science, though it's hard to see any clean hands this time around. Right, speaking about war, there's you know nobody comes out clean on the other side. I would argue that post enlightenment STEM fields driven societies or or more wealthy innovative societies that sprung out from this uh, evolution of thought or the enlightenment have been experiencing gradual yet exponential crisis of meaning, internal meaning, intrinsic value of the self. The best answer that any society can come together and agree on is to fulfill oneself by positively contributing to society and however positive that ambiguous aim rapidly falls apart because people are left to tear infinite interpretations of what, what's positive. So lack of meaning, that's the last symptom. And boy, does it, it's an irritating one. One could frame society this way as a boy lost in the woods with a broken compass, with nowhere to go and no meaning. Now, Post-separation of church and state in the early 1900s, and arguably a little bit earlier, but 
for the final separation and, and abolishment of these monarchies to the modern world, we have an increasing number of popularized atheists that start springing up and prosper in this environment uh, post-enlightenment through you know, the lens of reason and science. This is where science gets spun on its head, however, and gets its hands a little too dirty. The scientific method was never really devised to tell us what isn't true, though it may do sometimes, it merely is a consequence of learning what is wholly true. It's often said that an accepted theory is never refuted, rather better understood and expounded upon. Therefore, in my opinion, atheism creates an unnecessary argument for society. The repulsive tastes of monarchies left in the mouth of most westernized societies as a direct result of dogmatic ideology, in my eyes, is what left populations so separated from the essential spiritual connection humans acquire as a part of their mind, body, and spirit. Spirit, Keeley, the spirit that was lost post-enlightenment with the abolishment of the church. So, how do all these things manifest in our society into an illness? Hmm? Well, let's just take a look at World War II. When it came to World War II, some people will tell you it started in September 1939 when Hitler invaded Poland. Others will say such a dictatorship was inevitable given the financial crisis of Germany faced after World War I. However, my take is Germany was faced with a deeper philosophical issue that has not been addressed fully and runs rampant amongst the progressive elite of industrious and democratic societies today. You know, hindsight is 2020 and all, it merely has the potential to be. That does not mean that you will always have the best interpretation. For example, I don't believe Hitler to be anything special. I'm sure many of people have had the same demented goals, aspirations, and work ethic as Lil Alof, right? Copycat or not, what is special is the string of events and history that created an environment for such a monster to prosper. If I've learned anything from studying World War II, it's that if you take away the value structure that defines a society without offering a viable replacement for the code of ethic and policy beforehand, then you have a one-sided race left to win by whatever absolute power of the time is placed on a pedestal to corrupt absolutely, right? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, given credit where it's due, Hitler beat the Democratic Party system at its own game at the time. Since we have the same, we've seen this time and time again, where a predetermined dictator rises through the political ranks as a wolf in sheep's clothing, as Hitler so brilliantly did with Germany. You see, what defined Germany pre-World War I, and still does to a large degree, is their democratic commitment or their dramatic commitment, rather, to STEM fields and academia. This meaning crisis in Germany was a direct correlation to the harsh construction of Germany post-World War I. The critical blow to state pride and furthermore a spiraling of the working class into poverty left the layman of the society almost indifferent to the political sphere until someone was to come along with fake promises to bring out the poverty, cough, cough, welfare don't mean well for you, I believe that today we face an evolved strain of this very ideology I speak of that sprung from the death of Stalinism and Marxism. But what does the wolf disguise look like this time around, post-World War II? Well, the recipe is the same, of course. Replace the idea of leader with influencer. Influencers often have more tantalizing political answers that, when examined, have no feasible application to our society, a simple yet devastating restructuring of how authority hierarchies work within a given society. Right? We see this rampant across our more progressive societies today. What is different this time around that science or our mind and biology is evolving in our understanding of it faster than we can care to plug the spiritual meaning hole left in society's heart after the gods of creation that gave us meaning became increasingly harder to believe in. Right? So this beautiful big brother of answers, post-enlightenment has just been ripped out from under our societies and we're left picking up the pieces, so flustered and irritated and inflamed. Now flash forward to discover of quantum physics in the early 1900s you know, around the same time uh, as the abolishment of church and state. Well, so you have these quantum physics discovered by German physicist uh, Max Planck, and our understanding of reality is once again shattered through the lens of science. 
However, this time society leaned into the arms of science a bit too hard without addressing the bad breakup that it had just had with religion a couple centuries ago, even though it's not really over, as you may know. Um, however, you can tell I'm a fan of this metaphor. Uh, to grossly oversimplify, quantum physics is a broadening of the understanding of Einstein's already brilliant set of theories of relativity, which helped us to explain gravity. Now, that's some heavy stuff, yeah? Now, what quantum physics inevitably implies is an inevitable, infinite possibility of outcomes of reality, almost like an evolved Murphy's Law. Instead of, if it can happen, it will happen, quantum physics predicts that intellectually clued in minds would sometimes say, if it can happen, it already has happened in an infinite parallel universe. I'm sure you've heard this some half-witted, strung-together idea by your half-baked friend before. It usually is used in some way to justify having an invalid interpretation in the face of science. Nothing really matters, man. It's all in your head, man. Values are a construct, man. In a way, this is a religion of itself. An abrasive ideologue, right? You see, if there are any infinite opinions and personality traits, how could one be more valuable than another? How could we create a society? Right? Uh, participation trophies, right? Th this has been our undoing. Well, easily, you start to define those values around your apparent needs of the society and the world at large at the given time, and give this some context in history, and you have a recipe for a healthy, wealthy society, spiritually, mentally, and physically. This lack of meaning, what's it look like in our society today? How can we fix this today? Well, to me, it looks like a constant battle of the individual versus the individual to better define themselves within the context of their society in some hopes to make up for the lack of spiritual enlightenment that they crave post-enlightenment. To make their society a safe space and appall appallingly wield science like a weapon, almost. To, to, to use science as if it was a religion. And in this style of thinking, if you're not with us, then you're against us, emerges from this ideology. Though intellectually weak, it's, it's very effective, as you've seen, against the working class being worked to death, as we saw in Germany, for example. And if you don't agree, then you're a racist, you're a transphobic, white male patriarchy, insensitive, you're the new Hitler. Hmm. <laughs> I wonder why all these radicals chose the very guy that gave way to their strain of initial Marxist ideology. It's like a kid acting out all of his father's unresolved personal personality issues. Right? So, all in all, how, how do we take this into modern day? How do we better shape our lives to better shape the society that we live in so that our, our lives might benefit from the society that we live in? Well, lying ahead of us in westernized society specifically, are dangerously, dangerously repetitive ways of thinking. We are a society desperately in need of, or in danger of a repeat of what happened with World War II. Out of haste, but rather to enjoy the slow growing fruit of intellectual discourse, and hopefully we can save the democracy yet and furthermore reignite the spiritual passion that drove the last bursting forth of the arts and science for humanity. And how do one do, do, do how does one apply this to modern day? How does one put this into their life individually? Well, I, I don't know you, so I can't speak for you individually, but you could go above and beyond to understand others. And more importantly, if you find yourself across the table from someone in a differing opinion, do not be agitated or inflamed like our society, but rather be grateful for a chance to learn more about them and never overtly eager to assert your knowledge and conversational dominance over them. For within all harmony, balance resides. Thank you.